Repair Education Foundation in support of Korean Technical School and College collision programs across the country. Visit the Collision Repair Education Foundation website and uh, score yourself one of these uh, snazzy little shirts here. So, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to talk about painless dent repair and some of the considerations around it. Kind of go through a number of different pages. We got, like I said, we got a full house here. We got PDR Nation. We've got Hail Strategies. We've got NAPDRT and Jake, I think you're a day early. We're talking, about, early. We're talking about painless dent repair. I'm not really sure what scanning and diagnostics has to do with that, but maybe maybe we'll learn something along the way. So uh, let's start off with some introductions because, again, a lot of the programs we've been talking about so far have been really focused on collision repair and the processes around that. Um, and so painless dent repair is a little bit uh, outside of our norm, uh, so you may not be familiar with these organizations. So why don't we go around the horn, uh, introduce ourselves, and tell us a little bit about your organization. Hey, Don, um, I'm Dave Pinto. I'm the chairman for PDR Nation. We're a nonprofit trade organization. We focus a lot on continu continuing education, bringing things like scan tools and stuff to our, our industry and teaching our guys how to do the proper repairs. Very so. good. Sean. Sean Mueller with Hail Strategies. Uh, we are actually a catastrophic hail repair company. We're not a trade organization like the two gentlemen next to me, um, but we do do a lot of instructions and uh, training and help with the trade organizations and technicians as far as proper repairs, how to manage the storm, body shops call regularly, hey, how would we improve this process and we'll help them through that. Um, so we're, we're kind of a training company as well as a, a repair company, but a little different than the, the two gentlemen next to me. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mike Wall. I am the president of NAPDARC, the National Alliance of Paintless Dent Repair Technicians. Uh, we formed in 2006. We had a bunch of independent techs and just couldn't get things going this way, that way. Couldn't get along with the adjuster, that kind of thing. So collectively, a bunch of guys got together and said, hey, we need somebody that can help steer us in the right direction. So that's kind of how we formed way back then. We've been going strong and we're all about the education of not only the PDR techs, but the consumers, the insurance side, you know, the, the body shop side, anyone we can talk to or willing to talk to. Um, we also deal with some legislative issues when those come along as well. So, you know, we're also a nonprofit uh, and we work together well with PDR Nation. We both get along well, you know, we're not beating each other or anything. So, you know, collectively we make a good, good voice for the independent techs. Awesome. Jake, not, not like you need an introduction, <laughs> but... Uh, why don't you go ahead and give us a quick, a quick introduction yourself as well. Yeah, Jake Rodenroth, uh, Director of Industry and OEM Technical Relations for Aztec. Uh, I handle all of our OEM relationships and our industry-facing uh, activity, such as Collision Hub. There you go. <laughs> so we've been talking for, uh, for quite a while, and, and Sean, I've been talking to these guys about, uh, again, educating the industry. There's a lot, of, there's a lot more overlap today in, between PDR and Collision Repair than there was you know, five or certainly 10 years mm -hmm. ago. Um, and we wanted to start educating both industries on, on some of that overlap and some of the things that are out there. And we thought we'd kind of start off the show today with talking about from a, from a collision repair facility standpoint, you know, what should I be looking for in a paintless dent repair technician? So uh, guys, what are some of the things, you know, what do we want to talk about as far as, you know, if I have a PDR situation, you know, who am I looking for? Should I just find the, find the cheapest guy in the block or uh, what's, what, do I, what do I want to look for? So the answer to that is absolutely not a good answer. Um, no, so the, the first thing you're going to want to do is look at your shop and figure out what do I as a shop need? Am I looking for a catastrophe management? Do I have a thousand hail cars that need to get fixed and I can't touch them? Do I need somebody just to handle some door dings for me? Or unfortunately it happens, some shop cause dings. You know, you get a car ready for delivery, someone leans on it, puts a dent in it, you don't have time to repaint it. Who can you call to handle that? Typically those are not going to be the same type organizations or technicians or people. Um, so you need to figure out, first and foremost, what are your shop's needs for a PDR technician. Um, from there, you can move into, you know, the, the up-to-date on emerging technologies inside the industry. So are they up-to-date on the new materials? Do they know how to differentiate, um, you know, military grade from metal composite aluminum or the ultra high string steel and high string steels? Um, you know, what kind of NVH foam and and adhesives are used on cars. Can I cut through it to fix it? Can I not? What do I need to do to replace it? Um, if you are a shop that puts your guest safety first, they need to put your guest safety first. Um, picking the cheapest on the block is going to mean they don't know that stuff usually. They don't care. They're going to come out. We're not going to get into this part, but they're going to come out, pop a hole in the door, fix a dent, and go home. That is not what you want as a repair facility, period. Yeah. Um, and Dave probably has a couple more he wants to throw in there also. Well, I would say you, you need to find somebody that's going to fit your business model. Not every shop is run the same, so you may not have the same 
uh, looking, you may not be looking for the same type of tech, but I generally try and work with shops that, like he said, care about customer safety, care about these issues, ADAS, and, and doing things the right way. So, you know, you might, you want to find a technician that understands what you're, where you're coming from. Um, and it's going to fit with the, the business model that you're putting out there. If you're just a high volume shop, um, then, you know, you, you may be looking for a different kind of guy. But one of the other things that you're always going to want to know that they can fix the, the damage. So if you've got a hail storm, there's different types of hail damage. You're, you're going to have some really hard hit stuff and you might have some light hit stuff. Um, so, you know, you want to get a, a general sense that they can fix the dents. But from my experience, I think that's probably, I don't want to say it's the least important because you obviously want to have a guy sure. that can fix your dents, but you want to know that they can work with your shop in the same manner that you do and have the same values uh, in the repair process. Now, you know, Sean, you mentioned, I think it's, it's, that's the first observation from my perspective where I see some of that overlap. You mentioned material type identification. Um, again, we're not, we've historically been doing, you know, well, it's an older panel, it's just mild steel. Well, that's not necessarily the case anymore with, you know, we've got some high, higher strength steel panels. We've got some aluminum panels. Um, so for, for those PDR technicians out there, that's our first instance where, uh, first case, I think, where we need to, to be able to go into that OEM closure repair information for that material identification. You know, what exactly is it that I'm working on? Because I'm going to approach things differently uh, if, if it's a steel panel versus a high strength steel versus aluminum panel. I think those are that's that's the first kind of overlap that, that I want to point out here, I think, as we go through. Yep. And um, so um, now, what about uh, what do you think, Mike? Get some uh, additional things you think we want well, to Well, I mean, everything that we're saying is all spot on. The one thing I would probably say is you as a body shop or, or an automotive repair shop, whatever, if you're looking for a PDR tech, you need to be looking for it now versus when somebody calls you on the phone and says, I need this dent yeah. fixed. You know, you need to have your ducks in a row before you do that. Do your research online, in person, make some phone calls. Don't just have that, you know, let's say a catastrophe hits and there's a storm coming. You're going to have about seven different guys in your parking lot by 6.30 a.m. wanting to do your business. And they're all the best. They're, they're everyone yeah. is the best, and they've all got a little card they'll hand you and tell you, you know, we're going to take care of you. Here's my name. So you mean to tell me that you've never met the second best paint uh, No, no. <laughs> so that, that's where I would say, because it's going to be so darn overwhelming that you really need to get, to, and it's like anything, you just need to have a game plan before you need to utilize a game plan. Always have plan A in, in place and always be working on plan B and plan C. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I kind of need to kind of... Uh, conduct some type of, a, of an interview process almost, I guess I'd call So what are some of the things I would want to kind of ask a potential uh, vendor? Well, you're going to, you're hiring body tech, so I'm sure you've got a, a pretty good feel on how to judge a person's uh, abilities. You check the references, because everybody's going to come in and tell you, I've done these storm tests. Check the references, don't just take their word for it. Um, one of the things we do with uh, PDR Nation is all our technicians have online reviews. So okay. you can go in and actually see if they have reviews from previous customers that, and their verified reviews. Um, so you trying to think of what I wanted to say there, but that's right. Um, you you, you want to check your technicians, I guess. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I mean, and uh, it also kind of comes down to images. Everything if they're if they're walking in and they're sounding knowledgeable, professional, like they're actually in the industry with you, not just against you and trying to get a paycheck from you. That kind of goes a long ways too, but absolutely check the references, make a few phone calls. You know, internet searches is the thing now. Everything's on the interweb, so yeah. um, just going through that route and making sure that it's actually a stand-up. And then the next thing is, you don't if you know what kind of workflow you plan on. Say you want to get five cars a week, you got enough room in the shop for five, versus you got enough room in the shop for twenty a week. You need to see if they're coming in, if they're capable to have, handle that kind of workload too. So there's a bunch of little things you really just need to make a little checklist and, and kind of go through what do you want accomplished out of this? Do you just want something that's just gonna get your door dings done this week and you're not gonna worry about it until three weeks later when you see another estimate that calls for a PDR repair? Or do you want a long-term relationship? Okay. So again, I think preparation and, and making sure that it fits in your workflow process yes. is, is important. Now, when it comes to kind of quality control, there are things that I can do as, as, as a shop owner to know that yeah, I should go out and look and maybe see what, what that technician's working on. What are some ideas that I can kind of build in my SOP, some quality control along the way? Well, uh, and I go through my old adage is my best work goes unseen. If you don't see the work and you know it was there before and you don't see it now, obviously somebody's done a good repair. Sure. I've actually walked into shops and I'll do a demonstration for them and then they'll be like, well, I don't see anything. It's like, well, that's good. kind of yes. what paintless yeah. dent repair is. Well, the last guy, I could see all kinds of stuff. And I was like, well, then that wasn't, that was why he's your last guy. Now, mm -hmm. now we're looking at your, 
your, your new guy. guy. Yeah. So, you know, don't be afraid if if you're not comfortable with everything's lining up, don't be afraid to ask for a demonstration. Sure. I mean, I don't a ninety nine point nine percent of any tech would be more than happy to show you the kind of quality work they do. Yeah. Now, I want to look at that backside, that panel through. I'll make sure we're not drilling any holes in there. We're not yes, a bunch sir. of corrosion issues in there, and you know, removing foams yeah. and sealers and everything. With just just in the last five years, let alone ten, um, I've got some archaic tools back in my corner. I just like to go and say hi to every now and then. <laughs> yeah. We don't use them anymore. Yeah, I mean, we've come a long ways between adhesives and glue pulling and cold gluing, um, and just our tools are actually more finesse and have more spring to them and, and have a better bend flow. So, the the need for drilling a hole in a rail is gone. Mm -hmm. We don't endorse that at all. There's no nope. reason you need to do that. Uh, the reason, the need for drilling a hole in a hood, it's, you don't need to. It, it comes down to a point of the technician. If I cannot do this car properly and I'm not safe, I need to treat it like if my family's in this car. Sure. Yeah. If, if I got to drill a hole to get to that dent, I'm not going to fix it. We take it and have it done conventionally. You're, you're usually in a collision shop, so there's a yep. job for you guys to do and there's a job for me to do. Yep, if I'm not going to be able to do it properly, does. then you guys do what you do. Okay. And um, gotta, well, I was going to say to touch on what you both just said about do it properly. A good question is, do you have access to the OE procedures? Yep. Do you know how to translate it? Because, and this is a, a gray area, the OE procedures are for collision. But if an OE procedure says in explicit black and white, don't fix this flange because you can't tell if the adhesive is compromised. That does not give you permission to PDR that panel instead. It means don't fix it. Yeah. So if you are a PDR technician going into a shop, you should be able to have an educated conversation with how to remove the headliner out of vehicles, how to take the sunroof out of a Subaru. You should know that if I'm doing that, I now have to replace all the bolts on the airbags holding that, that sunroof in, right? If you can't do that, you're in the black ages, you need to start educating yourself mm -hmm. because all that's going to happen is you're going to keep getting deeper in the black hole and you're never going to be able to catch back up. Yep. So as a shop, I would say a, a big QC question is, do they have the procedures? Sure. You know, if they're R and I in your vehicles, if you're not the one doing the labor, does the person doing the work have the information to do the work properly? The answer to that question most of the time is no. And most people don't even think to check it. They sure. go out, the headliner's down, everybody's good, we're wrong. Okay. You know, so that, that to me is a, a very big point of contention with doing QC checks. And as the shop owner, how can you QC it if you don't know how to do it right? Sure. That's what I was gonna say is if, you know, the, the guy may be actually a very good painless stem repair technician, but he may, may not be strong in the R&I department. We're looking up the procedures. Yep. It's your shop, it's your customer, so if, he can't handle it, but he can fix the dents, then you need to make sure that you got somebody in the shop that can handle that extra workload um, and let him do what he does and yep. you do what you do. And that's the relationship side. Yeah, you know, you shouldn't be going point. through technicians yeah. every storm. You should have somebody that you trust enough to come in, you have that relationship, that rapport, you know. He comes in, we need to look up the procedures, we need to do the r and but my God, you cannot see a single dent when that guy gets done. If that's your relationship, that's great. And then there's some shops that go, we are so backed up with collision, we can't touch hail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> At that point, you need to be looking a little deeper. And you just have to, as a shop owner, it's your responsibility to put your guest safety first, period. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so tell me about this resource, pdrpages.com. What the, what, what's that all about? What's, what exactly can I find there? PDR Pages came about, uh, I believe it was around 2014. Yeah. Um, the two organizations, NAPDRT and PDR Nation, we got <laughs> gathered technicians from all over the country. Um, they work for bigger companies, they work for independent companies by themselves, and we went through uh, a whole list of procedures that we needed to do, and why fixing a one-inch dent in the middle of a hood might be different than fixing a one-inch dent in the middle of a rail or different materials and all. So we went through a painstaking uh, consortium of, of people just going through what is absolutely necessary to do it the right way um, why do we need to do things like if you're doing a hail car and you've got to take the hood off the car why do you have to take it off why can't you just fix it while it's up you know so we we went through and we made a list of all the operating procedures to do a proper PDR repair um, from our standpoint we're the only organ uh, both nonprofits so we don't have money involved in the game it's not a financial thing it's about getting the job done right. Um, so that for us is a resource in the paintless dent repair community. 
that when we go into a, a, a shop and we're doing a, a job and we have to make an insurance claim or we're negotiating with the insurance company and they're saying, well, you know, the, a lot of the insurance companies will have agreements with bigger paintless dent repair companies that may opt to not charge for that operation, but it's still required procedures. And, it, you know, if I don't have that agreement, then I need to get paid to do it the way I'm going to do it. Um, and there's a lot of other little things in there, but that's the main focus on it is the repair operations. So uh, a good thing to know, say, if, if I'm talking to you as the body shop side, um, why would you even be concerned in reading this? So let's say you're writing the estimate, and it could just be a door ding in the, in the right rear door. Um, you can go on to PDR pages. You can scroll down and look at, oh, okay, so now we need to remove inner trim panel to get access. Now we need to, it, it helps break it down in your mind as well. You know, PDR, the old days of just, like I said, the old days back in the early, early 90s, late 80s was drill a hole, get in there and fix the dent. That's, that's not appropriate anymore. This is a new world. This is, a, this is now where we need to access the panel correctly, do the repair, and then when we're done, we want to make it look like we were never there. Right. And you've got so, a lot more variables these days. Yes. Um, you know, back in there, you didn't have three different size vehicles, SUVs and lifted pickup trucks, and you got yeah. sports cars. So if I've got to do a, a dent in the middle of a roof on a Toyota Corolla with no sunroof, it's a pretty flat panel, not a, no a, obstacles other than dropping the headliner. You put that same thing on top of a, a tall vehicle with a rib roof that I can only see from one angle. Now I may have to pull out the rear glass. I'm gonna, I may have to be working off of a step stool, um, checking it, because when you do paintless temperature, you have to check it from different angles. And if it gets down inside one of the little gullies, it makes it much more difficult. So that's a more time consuming repair to do that dent versus the one in the middle. So these are all the factors that are listed in the PDR pages uh, that'll help you come about and explain why this isn't the same dent as the other okay. dent. Right. And it's something like I can materials. incorporate in my blueprinting process? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, so let's see what else we got here about uh, vehicle cleanliness. Um, is yeah. that part of our... It's, it's pretty easy. You can't circle damage. You can't write an estimate if you can't see what you're looking at. So okay. the first thing any shop should do on any type of impact, I don't care what it is, is wash, wash the car off. Like, yeah. If you bring it in and it's dusty, dirty, like this truck behind you isn't super dusty, but it's dusty enough that it will make dents look <laughs> less. Yeah. Dave. <laughs> it will make dents look less severe than what they actually are. Yeah. So if you just, you know, hit it with a quick detail real quick, wash it or wipe down that quick detail, you're going to see a whole different dent and you didn't do anything but clean it off. So cleaning the vehicle should always be your number one step whenever you begin the blueprinting process, which I still go into shops that have no idea what blueprinting is, and I know most PDR companies don't even understand the concept. Yeah. So we're not gonna get into that here today, um, but something you guys need to do is educate yourself on it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Collision Hub has a really good video in their, is it the library or their, and on the, uh, yeah, one of their on libraries. Their YouTube, uh, YouTube channel, we've got a blueprinting episode on there. We talk about blueprinting quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's developing that repair plan. And again, I think there's another area where there's some overlap that again, Paintless dent repair technicians maybe historically haven't had to worry about blueprinting and kind of repair planning. It's show up, fix the dent, get out of there. But I think, again, as we are dis disconnecting things, or th we need to re really think yeah. about it, following the OEM procedures, knowing the material. That's all part of that blueprinting process. Yep. Okay. Um, and then obviously, we have to, now we get the vehicle clean, um, and now lighting becomes critical. I know that we're, I see PR technicians always are getting the lights set up and adjusting the lights, and I don't really know what we're looking for, but uh, what, what, is, what exactly are we looking for? So what we do with the lights, we get them adjusted. Usually we're looking straight at a light, but we're not looking at the light, we're looking at the, the, the backdrop on the finish of the vehicle. So you're using that light as a reflection. So without that light, this dent will look like this dent. With the light, it helps us actually see the true depth and severity of it. So that's why it's critical to have uh, one or, or numerous, I carry five of them with me every day of the week, and they're different sized lights. I always have plenty to see. Mm -hmm. So the reason for that is I need to be able to see what I'm gonna repair. I need to be able to show whoever is paying the bill what I'm fixing. Yep. Um, the body so, guys like to use their hands to feel, we, we still use our yep, eyes. Yep, um, our eyes are your hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. an old body guy, so I was that same way. But, you walk yeah. into a shop that has the, uh, the LED lights or the uh, 
like these canister lights and you can't use that kind of it just washes yeah it out. washes so it all we, out so we, we, we typically you know years ago we started out with one little bulb strip and oh, you know, yeah. we all did that but now it's it's transverse you know it's transcended into leds a lot more efficient lights and a lot brighter lights which has helped everybody tremendously but yeah typically at like an led style light or a bulb style light to reflect the lights onto the panel so we can see the damage and then we can you know address it and write the get the blueprint going and get the estimate going and get the repair going. And uh, something else too is, um, I don't remember the company, but they have the the checkerboard dent board. Uh, you know who yeah, it is? The collision edge. Is that what it is? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know that if you don't have PDR lighting and you're yeah, just that. trying to kind of get a quick idea of, okay, what are we looking at? You can still use that. It, it's more similar to what, what we call in our industry as a line board. Literally, it's a board with lines on it. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but that still helps you get an idea of what you're looking at. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've had a lot of companies that have brought us in and said, well, you know, that den is this big. Okay, we'll circle it. Grab the line board, grab your den or what is it, collision edge board, yep. throw it up there like, oh my God, now circle it. They circle it. Then we put our light on it and they go, oh man. <laughs> and, and it's even bigger, bigger and, bigger. and yeah. it's bigger again. And the reason for that is whenever you have the, the newer technologies and you're not just assuming and you're actually using that stuff to your advantage, you don't miss stuff. You see the shadows, you see the distortions, you can see the clear coat differences and the orange peel and things like that. And, and honestly, you guys have been doing PDR longer than me, but the new lights have got to be better than what they had in the past oh, yeah. because mm -hmm. you can dim it down and see the individual orange peel. Yeah. And if you're not careful, you start fixing it yeah. <laughs> while you're fixing yeah. the dent. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as a PDR technician coming into it, you know, I'm only a 12 year technician. I don't have 20, 30 years in the field. For me, I look at what we have now and I'm like, oh, you know, this is great. And then, you know, I talk with these guys like, oh, back in the day yeah. when I yeah, had no this idea. line, we, <laughs> you know, so, you know, you have these things to your advantage and at your disposal, start using them. Sure. You know, the information is there. The ability to do things correctly is there. Just start doing it. You know, I think that's the biggest problem is starting and then we can start getting somewhere. Okay. Now as a closure repair uh, owner, uh, is there something that I need to know, you know, a top panel versus side panel or the differences there that I need to be aware of? Yeah. Well, when you're working on a, a top panel um, versus a side panel, you've got more angles to look around it. Okay. So if you're walking around the car and you, you're looking at the hood from all different directions, when you're looking at a door, you're basically front yeah, and back, you, just a couple, yeah. you know, the, so when you run into top damage, um, you're working with a lot more visual angles. So you have to cross check it a lot more. And the other issue would be um, a lot of the top panels are going to be flatter, um, a little less curve and stuff like that. And when you're working with uh, stretched metal, hiding that stretch into the panel, getting it totally flat is going to be way more obvious if it's got a little mound on the, in the middle of the roof or the hood versus on the side of a door. So. And that's, that's something we can tie back into choosing a PDR company. Mm -hmm. Do they fix the whole vehicle or do they only fix the sides? That, that is something to really think about because being on the road, there are a lot of companies that won't touch a top panel, which would be like a hood roof, deck lid, things like that. They'll only fix the sides. Okay. And then the shop gets stuck with replacing hoods, roofs, and deck lids, which those are the hardest things to replace. <laughs> so it's not beneficial. Um, you know, like Dave said, to fix a hood and a roof, the customer and the repair technician has, let's say a thousand angles to look at it. Whereas a door, you might have four or five, unless you're going to crawl around on the ground and, you know, do all that stuff. Sure. Uh, so it is definitely a, a challenge to fix top panels. And now with some of these side panels, it's just as bad. These body lines coming out. Uh, yeah. Woo. <laughs> we were looking at the, uh, the new Hyundai today. Everything's got an angle, like yeah. a, a sharp point yeah. coming out and, you know, and that's typically the furthest point out on the side is what gets hit. When yeah. somebody opens up a car door, it's going to hit the farthest point out. When you've got a curved, you know, uh, body line, it's not as bad as a, a sharp point. So it's it's always a challenge. Things are always changing that way. Um, top panel, side panel. The other issue I would talk about would be bracing is going to be different in a door. Um, you may not be able to get access at all into a quarter panel. Sure. So you may need to use accessibility more accessibility becomes yeah, an issue. That's a, that's a bigger, you know, to, it, you have to gut the entire rear quarter panel trim to, to get a tool in there to, to do the repair. Okay. So those are some of the other uh, accessibility issues there. 
Now, when it comes to, you know, um, from a labor operation standpoint, um, and we're not going to talk about, you know, specifics or not, but what are some things I need to be thinking about uh, when it comes to labor so I can, uh, so I, let's, let's talk about some of the access and, and labor. What are some of the operations I want to make sure that I'm accounting for? And similar to what I was just saying, like if you're getting into a quarter panel or you're dropping a headliner, you're going to have to take apart the interior of the vehicle. Um, so if you're going to drop a headliner and you're going to do it the right way and you follow the OE procedures, you're going to have a lot of operations. Sean does more hail than me, so I'll let him kind of talk so, about the R&I side of the interior. So up on your guys' screen right now, you, you should see or you should be seeing in a second two photos of, of separate vehicles that are hail damage vehicles. The, the one on the right is going to be a Subaru Forester. Um, the one on the left, I'm sorry, the one on the left is the Forester. The one on the right is going to be a Toyota Prius. Um, and if you notice the extent that the vehicles are taken apart too, it, it speaks volumes for what you have to do. That's specifically to fix the roof, to get the headliner out. So just to remove a headliner in that Toyota Prius, that vehicle essentially is completely gutted except the two front seats. You know, the seat belts are still in because of how the, the upper trims are there. The quarter trims are all right. Um, you know, the battery's disconnected how it should be. The negative battery's disconnected. All of that stuff is done specifically just to fix that roof panel. Um, and that's gonna tie back into that blueprinting process. So if you're blueprinting correctly, that's already done. So now you know the labor needed if the clips break. And you know, a lot of vehicles now say don't reuse clips. Sure. You need Those to account for that stuff, right? And yep. Um, and if you notice on the, the red vehicle, that the entire interior is covered with, with plastic. Mm -hmm. That is to protect the interior of the vehicle, the headliner, because on that particular vehicle, um, the shop did not want the rear seatbelt removed. They just wanted the, the couple dents on the roof fixed and then everything put back up. Yeah. Um, so the entire vehicle is covered in plastic. So whenever we respray the corrosion protection, it doesn't contaminate anything okay. else. If you guys haven't used corrosion protection, you don't know this. If you have, you know it stinks really bad. <laughs> so if it gets on a headliner and it doesn't dry all the way, that car is going to stink for a while. You just want to cover it up to, to CYA. And I think, you know, the access to it also really speaks, you know, that I need that for my damage assessment part yep. as well. So if I just look at the outer panel, if I don't know what yeah, is underneath there the with the braces and with wiring and with trim, you know, I don't want to really understand. I can't really write an accurate assessment of the damage that's exactly. needed to be in there. Okay. And, and something else too, if, if those photos are still up, is if you look at the bracing on the roof of those two, um, it's harder to see on the red car, but you can see a couple. Okay. Um, you know, you'll notice that the roof bracing is not the same. And you know, in the Toyota, there isn't a whole lot of glue holding it on, but that glue is ignorantly tight. Yeah. So getting a whale tail, it's our little tools that get in the braces in there, you almost have to cut the glue off. If I'm doing that, how am I replacing it? I need to use the proper adhesives for that to get that job done right. Yeah. On the other one, the braces are nowhere near as tight, but there's still foam that I can damage. And that's the anti flutter flow. Mm -hmm. If I remove that, is the roof gonna make a weird noise when I drive down the highway? <laughs> it's there for a reason, right? So, exactly. so you need exactly. to be restoring that stuff. And and I think that's where the big points of contention come is people don't wanna do that 10, 15 minute upfront leg work. They just, I've done it for 30 years. Everybody's a 30 year tech, it seems like. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've done it for 30 years. I know better. I'm doing it my way, just shh, and go in the corner. <laughs> it's always 30. Yeah, so, it's yeah. always starting. I, I finally <laughs> met someone who's been doing it for 10 or 12 years. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's finally, well, it's, 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 in the painless dent repair industry, they all started two. two? Nobody okay. ever comes out of school <laughs> less than two years of <laughs> experience. Yeah. Got it. Well, it's, it's pretty labor intensive. It just wears you out. So yeah. you're out of <laughs> two years. I'm actually been doing it for two years. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He's so, almost at two. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, okay, so now that we pulled the headliner and disconnected some stuff, now I know why Jake is here, yeah. I think. So, there you go. Um, Jake, what are some of the things that can happen? Number one, let's first, first of all talk about when I am pulling headliners and disconnecting stuff. What can I do? And then let's talk a little bit about this truck that we've got here um, and what we found out before we even did that and why we want to do that. So let's start, first of all, let's, Let's yeah. pull the headliner. What are some things they might run into in that process? Well, you know, it, what we see in the PDR environment is a lot of the comfort and creature features. You know, the things that the, the driver is interfacing with on a daily basis. And I think one of the key drivers behind that is the trim level. You know, obviously higher trimmed vehicles are going to have more features. You know, virtually all of them will have a Bluetooth. But as we found in Sean's vehicle, he has the, uh, the DASM module on the windshield, which has the radar and camera system that work together. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of different than everybody else. A lot of people put the radar down in the bumper or in the grill area. 
Um, not, not so on the DT Ram truck, they put it in the windshield. So um, very different. And you know, running, running the post diagnostics on the, on the vehicle gives you the opportunity to do not only just the scan to see the DTCs, but also the bi-directional control. So I'll direct you to the passenger side window. Did you mean pre-diagnostic on that one, Jake? Pre or post. Okay. Yeah, so you know, that's something, you, obviously the sooner you can get it in the process, the better. Well, that's, but certainly the minimum you want to do is the post, right? Well, um, why would you do a, a post without having a pre, to a baseline? Well, obviously, you know, what are you looking for in a pre? In a pre, I'm looking to make sure that I, anything that I'm getting into this vehicle, it just pulled into my shop, I have no idea whose it is, where it is, what it's right. done, what it's been through. So anything I touch, once I start taking things apart, I own it. Yeah. Um, so you're looking for a pre-existing issue. Uh, yeah, I'm looking yeah. to just we no hope different than any, walking around the vehicle and looking to see if the bumper's hanging off or, you know, if there's a big gouge in the tailgate that when yeah. the customer comes and picks it up and goes, that wasn't there. Yeah. Ran over a ladder. So yeah. I want to know what's going on with the electrical system and, right. the, and the, the computer system before I start taking anything apart so I don't own it. Any sure. Other issues. So, so like this truck here, um, we haven't done it. We didn't remove any trim. We didn't nope. disconnect anything, and there's no codes on it, Jake. Is that is that correct? Uh, that would not be the case. That's not the case. <laughs> not the case. Uh, you know. Sorry. I, I will tell you. I feel like uh, it was it Mari Povic, where you're not the father. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I feel right now. And and uh, you know, beyond just the scanning things, I think people underestimate what scan tools can actually do. So, in a hypothetical where you guys push some dents out in the door. It gives me an opportunity to bypass the switch and check functionality and make sure you plugged everything in, right? So, in your case, the window is down, and I can roll it up, right? <laughs> that works. So I can send the command, and the truck will respond accordingly, right? And so I think you saw me test the lighting just a second yeah. ago. Don't um, do that again. We got yeah. you. <laughs> so um, I think I sent uh, Collision Hub team a, a photo of the topology of this vehicle. And what's something that's really cool about the Chrysler scan tools, it gives you a visibility of not only all the controllers on the network, but what's equipped and what's not equipped, what has DTCs, what doesn't have DTCs. If you've got battery voltage failures, it'll tell you that as well. So Sean, um, <laughs> I'm seeing that you exceeded your payload limit according to your air suspension. So you had something heavy in your bed that oh. your air suspension didn't like. Yeah, it's, it's not in the bed. It's a, a 12,000 pound boat. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so the, the truck will tell those dirty secrets. And, 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 and I'll let you read that. You see I don't that? want to. Payload ex good. exceeded, right? So oh, yeah. I can also see that he is quite the audio uh, guy, right? Because I'm seeing the amplifiers going nuts with all 12 channels of showing unplugged open circuits here. Uh, you know, it's like, man, I'm processing this under warranty. I'm gonna go crazy. Uh, so I also see a parking sensor open. So tell us about the parking sensor, Sean. That would be from a ladder. So a ladder took out the parking sensor. Yep, definitely. Showing an open highway. circuit, right? And then we're also seeing a communication error with the camera module in the rear. I got nothing for that. It works. I don't. I have no idea why that would so even be there. So have you had the truck? Have you had the tailgate off? No. No. Okay. Oh. So this can also be a battery voltage issue. So if he's lost, you've had the battery disconnected a couple of times? Yeah. Okay. It's been to the shop. I mean, it's a Dodge, so there's been issues, but <laughs> it's been to the shop to get stuff fixed before too. <laughs> they all break. Yes, they do. For our Dodge friends out there. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, the thing is, is that people underestimate the detail that a scan tool can give you. Yeah. And uh, you know, as we're gonna talk about tomorrow, a lot of the new security protocols that OEMs are putting in the vehicles, and this is one of the first mainstream vehicles to get it. So when you look at the, uh, I'm not sure if they have the diagram or not. Did you guys get it? Okay. So the diagram you'll see down at the bottom, and I'll pull it up here so you guys can see what we're talking about here. And I'm going to look over your shoulder. So you can see the scan tool port down at the bottom, mm -hmm. and then you'll see SGW, which is the secure gateway. So if you don't have the correct credentials to access the gateway, whether you're using Ottawa through an aftermarket uh, J2534 device or using the YTEC uh, OEM scan tool, you don't get access to the truck. So the bi-directional commands, the rolling the window down, the things that we went through. You might be able to pull DTCs, but you may not get full functionality of the scan tool. So as you start repairing things and you go in and start sending those commands to the vehicle, you got a power running board? Yeah. So the power running board is an example on the RAM truck, must be initialized by a scan tool when it's removed. So those kinds of scan tool supported parts will play a big role in the future going forward. So you're saying we can't just go to AutoZone and have them do a DTC and we're, we're just cleared with everything. You can do anything once, <laughs> but I, I do not recommend that. That's, well, that's and, the importance is knowing the tools yeah. and how they actually work right. and knowing how to use them. And so, they're different by OEM with different levels of functionality. So out of curiosity, this Dodge Ram pulls into my shop and I'm getting ready to do a job and 
I skip the the pre scan yep. and just get in there and yeah. start digging away and yeah. doing my thing. I disconnect the battery. I do. So now I, I put it all back together. Um, how do I know what I did and what do I know? Great point. What was there? Yeah. How many um, how many GTCs by the way, guys? What you want to know? <laughs> Hey, sure it's it a does. Dodge, so <laughs> who knows? But it hasn't had any PDR well, yet. It hasn't had any PDR, yeah. but it's had some audio work. Yeah, I'm gonna say like and five. 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 I know ladder because I know about the ladder, and I know what the yeah. few. Yeah. I'm gonna add a couple more on. So it. sixteen is the number. Sixteen. Sixteen. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think I, I think I sent the list so, that, so everybody can so see it. But let, uh, me, let me ask another quick question: How many lights are on on the dash? Oh no, it should be fine. Absolutely Zero. not. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So and here's here's something else to think about is. Jake looked at the truck beforehand, and other than the missing sensor, uh, the missing sensor, which is from me running over a ladder. Okay, we knew about that. Uh, did you know anything was wrong with the truck? Visual, is, visual is there inspection. Any really visual didn't. cues at all for you? And this is what you do yeah. that would scream out to you, "Oh my God, there's going to be issues." Well, there was a very large booming sound <laughs> coming from the radio when I uh, turned the key on, so that was hint number one. But. Yeah. But uh, other no, than that, I mean, other so than nothing. that, I mean, it, it looked like a, a pretty plain Jane truck that didn't have much going on. So, just so y'all know, it's not plain Jane. I <laughs> yeah. kind of resent that a little bit. Yeah. But <laughs> thanks, but, Jake. <laughs> yeah. So the reason we're talking about this, uh, when we go to dent guys, mm -hmm. basically, is that you know, even though we're not doing collision, yeah, we're still heavily involved in these vehicles and the and diagnostic again, parts of and, the vehicle. And once we've taken a possession of this vehicle, we're there's not a customer out there that would come and say I was responsible right. for something that yeah. I didn't do, yeah. would they? I would, I would say the collision no. repairs use a pre-scan in a little bit different way. You guys are more concerned with pre-existing issues, things we're, like that. It's more of a liability. We're color. looking for a repair, right. a part, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Right. It's certainly pre-existing issues, but uh, we're really actually trying to use that pre-scan to identify something downstream right. that we're going to be a, uh, responsible for. So here's but, a side note to that, though: Can dents still cause issues with sensors? really depends what you're working on because I've seen, especially in your space, a lot of satellite airbag sensors being pressure airbag sensors, things like that. Um, you, you don't want to uh, change the way those things work. You know, um, mm -hmm. people underestimate water vapor barriers and things like that and the effect that they have on a door shell. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty serious stuff. So watch mm -hmm. that stuff carefully. And up on your guys' screen now, you should see a couple diagrams with um, with just some weird kind of mumbo jumbo we'll get into in a second. And then a really weird photo with this like tin foil disc in a door. We'll get into that in a second also. Yeah. Um, but Jake, here's a, another question for you. So pretty much, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this one. Um, oh, we will. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> pretty much every vehicle now, before you start working on it, tells you to disconnect the negative battery. That's right. Okay. So if I'm taking a headliner out, number one step on every vehicle I've seen for the past couple years is disconnect negative battery. Yep. Okay. Jake, can't trim a dependent, of course. Can that? Yeah. cause issues well before you go there what shop do you know researches how to disconnect a battery it's that's a, the root cause it's a 10 they, millimeter oh, nut. you yeah. just take that yeah. off yeah. and you're good it's so much more uh -huh. you know and that's the piece they miss is that mm -hmm. researching how to disconnect a battery alerts you that this vehicle hey has you know a battery re a sensor on that measures battery voltage and detunes the alternator accordingly yep. mm -hmm. could have all kinds of features that need to be reinitialized either with a scan tool or done local at the vehicle uh, so, you know, the battery disconnects are a, are a huge one, and, and that's for collision repairs, too. Yeah. You know, you're looking for constant ways to get reimbursement beyond a position statement. Battery disconnects are a good way sure. to start. Yeah, so I think there's a few things we, we kind of touched on, you know, again, as, as a painless stand repair technician. If I don't know what DTCs are there to start with, I can't prove after the fact that I didn't put them in, in a lot of right. cases. Um, again, if I'm pulling trim, hardware, disconnecting things, I may need to disconnect the battery, which then potentially could run me down a whole list of other items. The other day, um, we did an owner's manual presentation um, at the World's mm -hmm. Fair here, and we went through a Subaru, and when you disconnect the battery in the Subaru, there are 15 or 20 different things that we need to think about doing. So just because and that's I'm, just in the owner's manual. It's just yeah. in the owner's manual. And that's free. It's in the glove box usually. Yeah, so so we've got this this illustration here of the airbag, just so the, where the sensors and the wires are located. Um, but so if I'm in those areas and I want to protect the vehicle, I may need to dis disable the battery in that in those locations, disable you know, disconnect some wiring, maybe pull some bags potentially, um, just for paintless dent repair. So now when I reconnect that battery, there may be a whole list of things and that I need to do. It, to it really goes back to what they initially said. Trim level is the huge driver on how many systems you get and how many resets you're going to do. Because the base model car may have very simple systems like traction control, 
where you're going to do a steering angle and reset after a battery disconnect. Yep. But then you're going to get into more advanced vehicles that have automatic lift gates, mm -hmm. you know, intelligent keys, things like that. You, you only did PDR on the front, but now the lift gate doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? But you mean so, I can't just disconnect the negative battery and, and touch them together please, and everything's please, good? Please, please do not do that. Yeah. Please don't do that. It, and if I drop a headliner, I may have to do some calibrations potentially for yeah, four so cameras. cameras yeah. what, what if I decide I just don't want to unplug? I don't want to get into that, so I can just like pull things out of the way. Like we were talking earlier, a uh, very common vehicle on the road these days is the uh, the F-150. Yeah. And you know, I get a bedside dent, and I want to pull that tail light out, and I'm just going to let it hang, yeah. and I'm going to fix my dent. Is that going to be? Any yeah, issues? so you know, the F-150s are unique. They use a PMI configuration to to reset the controller. And so you may have initializations that you need to do to make sure it's, it's not a, a target required vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, but still, you know, there's test drives involved and things like that. So, you make so sure. even just pulling the light and not even unplugging it can... Well, it goes back to the root cause. What shops do you know? Research <laughs> how to take a tail light out. There you go. They just do it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah. so, so they find out after the fact when somebody complains or a dash light comes on. Right. And, that, and that's generally what um, we see. Unfortunately, so. the dash lights don't come on enough right yeah i think at this point well it's a bad it's a it's a black eye on the brand right yeah. it's mm -hmm. a black eye on the oem that every time they turn around a lights on yep. yeah. and so it's really intrusive to a vehicle owner uh, but i'll tell you as more telematics become more prevalent with oems uh, they're going to push those notifications to an app instead of a dash light yeah, so okay. in other words hey mr customer somebody's messing with your tail light on your f-150 yeah. and you're in, in a business meeting going what's going on yeah, yeah, right? yeah, and yeah, so yeah. Uh, I get those kinds of alerts on my Titan all the time. If you connect a factory scan tool to it, I get maintenance alerts. Go visit, schedule with your dealer, schedule with your dealer. And so, you know, it's gonna ask, it's gonna arm our consumers with a lot of probing questions that they can ask a repair. Right. And if you're not ready to answer them, uh, it could be a long day. And you've got a, you've got a customer story, right? Your grandfather with, yeah. with what, what, tell us your customer well, story. Well, you know, he, he's the, uh, he's the oddball 91 year old. You know, he has a Facebook account, iPad, you know, uh, he was a, uh, he worked for Litton Electronics. And so he's a night vision guy. And so he's, he's got full-blown uh, uh, OnStar in his Malibu and dropped the vehicle on a Tuesday. Thursday, he got the OnStar report. DTCs were active. He could see tire pressure low on the left side. I mean, he's like, I get that report every month. Why does it look different this month? I'm like, yeah, they got to take the car apart, man. I mean, that's what they do. You know? so, so, but the point is, is that but nobody explained customers are going to get those. They're going to yeah, get yeah. them. They are getting them. Are. Right? Yeah. And, you know, the, the thing is, is that nobody explained that to him up front. Hey, you may get some alerts from your vehicle perfectly natural. We're going to run you through diagnostics at the end, so we'll show you everything. Uh, we've got to start asking those probing questions. Yeah. And, and I think it goes back to the, the first show that we talked about at the fair was that, that, that you know, the communication with the customers. Mm -hmm. So I think we have those communication conversations up front with them saying, hey, just so you're aware, here are some things that may happen as we go yeah. through this. I think that helps build that trust, builds that confidence. They go, oh, and when they get that email, now it's like, oh, I know about this versus like, what are they doing to my car? Yeah. Um, so I think that that's really a, a, a Customers are it. gonna do it because yeah. it's cheap. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you, the first, I've had my truck two months, the first six months are free. I have all of the available service, the remote start capability, all that stuff is free for six months. And then I can subscribe for a year and it's cheap. It's like 60 bucks a year. And it's worth it to crank your AC up from the other side of the soccer yeah. field mm -hmm. through the app to pay 60 bucks a month, it's worth it. So yeah, we, you're gonna we have customers. We heat in Wisconsin. Not, not yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I feel bad for you guys, yeah. you know, so. But so the, the basic nuts and bolts of that is you didn't disconnect the tail light, you just took it out and you can still have issues with the radar and, and you things have of that performance issues, so, right? Yeah. So there, there's a very big discrepancy and a very big issue in the industry right now of, well, I didn't disconnect anything. It's not my fault. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Like yeah. you still took it out. Another good example is, is headliners. You know, all three of us, and I'm, I'm sure you two also, because you guys are in some PDR stuff as well, have seen photos of headliners ripped out, no pillar trims taken out, just dangling off the little wire in the front that holds your camera in place. Yeah or your lane keep assist in place. That now is not lined up or aimed how it used to be or how it's supposed to be. So, okay, cool, you didn't disconnect that camera. That's awesome. But that does not mean that you didn't break it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, number one, why are you dangling a 20 pound headliner on two little tiny wires? It's, that's stupid. Yeah. But past that, you still need to know and you need to educate yourself on how to fix these issues and how to avoid them. You know, we're here today to try to stop the issues that you can arise. And it's real easy. Look in an odor's manual, look up the OE procedures, talk with body shops. You know, if you service a good body shop, ask them, hey, I don't know this car. Do you know anything special about it? Build that rapport up. And, yep. and start figuring out together because body shops are, are slacking on it. 
PDR companies are really slacking on it. So everybody kind of needs to come up together. Sure. You know, if we got to hold hands, then let's hold each other's hands and kumbaya dance or whatever. Yeah. But we need to start figuring this out together as a team. Well, it's, it, you know, I started hearing about this stuff out at SEMA, uh, I guess 2016, and it was a big, big year. They were rolling out all this stuff, and I'm like, you know, you, you thought about the ADAS back then was, oh, that's a BMW or Mercedes, yeah. high-end luxury car, I don't have to worry about it. And they were telling us that, you know, 2022, there's 22 manufacturers are gonna have this standard in everything. Well, we're coming up on 2021, and nobody wants to be the last one right. to, okay, so to have it. Here's the next warning, you ready? Right. It's 2020, uh -huh. every OEM is working on an EV. Yeah. Yep. Every single one yeah. of them. So I've seen the commercials for the Mercedes. You're, uh, you're going to have orange cables for for high voltage. Yeah. You're going to have purples for 48 volt. You know, so this this truck has optional 48 volt power pack in the back. Wow. And yep. so as you're taking that trim apart and your technicians are interfacing with that stuff, mm -hmm. make sure you understand how to disable and enable. Yeah. And all those kinds of, and a lot of times that stuff is free because first responders need it too. Right. To disable and enable, right? Yeah. And so, you know, remember as more voltage comes on board, oh, yeah. we need less mechanical parts we moving have, things. So we that's have some training available out there for electric vehicles. Yeah. Um, our, the paintless dent repair industry has IMI. Uh, I know um, ICAR has some online stuff you can do, but it's all stuff that you need to, to realize that the industry is changing at such a fast pace. Sure. Um, you know, it, it you my industry gauge is when I look in the trade pest, it's still, it's still, uh, sure, ADAS, everything, yeah, right, which is yeah. fine, but where's the EV stuff? Yeah, because it's yeah, California's you know, said they're not going to sell in the future. I just yeah. saw right before we came on, uh, Quebec announced that 2035, no more new no. gas yeah. vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We'll see what happens. That's a, that's a few years off yet, but yeah, so it comes right up on you quick. And believe yeah. it or not, that was part of my problem in 16 was that realizing how much of this stuff was out there that even you know, collision industry nobody knew about except for a handful of people and we were like we've been fixing these cars wrong already yeah and we're just going to start seeing more and more and more let's of fix them. them more on so you yeah. know let's all get let's keep up with the times as best we can and, and help each other out along the way so let's close out the show with some free resources that are out there because again um uh, there's there's a lot of training available there's a lot of you know kind of paid resources and things but there's a there's also a host of free resources out there so um, if you're from the painless net repair industry and you're watching the show today um, certainly first and foremost for, for me anyways is collision hub I'll tell you what, right i i've learned more in you know doing what i do going through the collision industry and, and learning what you guys are learning um, and trent that's part of what i do with pdr nation is bring it back to the painless dent repair industry and say listen guys this is what we need to be aware of. So Collision Hub's an excellent resource and you know, we, I follow you personally, so. So we've got, we've got thousand plus videos on our YouTube page and we're adding you know, another 30 plus over those yeah, these yeah, two weeks. weeks. Um, PDRpages.com, we already talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, DEG Web is another good resource uh, for, for, for out there. Um, OEM One Stop um, is something that, that's definitely a, a great resource. Um, there's some uh, like GM and other vehicle forward have their, their steel repairability matrix on there. So they'll let you know the different types of steel you might run into, um, what you can and can't do with them. So again, just from, a, from an awareness standpoint, uh, there's position statements on there. So again, as we've been talking about both scanning diagnostics um, and some of those always that may require a pre-scan, a post-scan, uh, certainly much more than that. And there's a lot of stuff that goes in it, but that's, unfortunately, I think J2, we've kind of, on the collision side of things, we've kind of gotten a little bit past the whole debate around pre-scan, post-scan, and moved on to other issues. We hope, right? We, yeah. but, but on the PDR side, certainly, I think we're still, yeah. that's, that's relatively new, same thing on the glass side of things. Yeah. Those are more relatively new, and again, we're starting to see a lot more overlap in collision, PDR, and then I just mentioned well, we, glasses. We attended, glass we attended the, the Mobile well. Tech Expo this year to try yeah. to reach out to our, our PDR friends, so uh, that's yeah. something we, we hope to continue. Yep. Good. Um, and then OEM repair manuals. Now, a lot of these, granted, are subscription based, um, but still um, having access to that when you're working on a vehicle is going to let you know hey, if I do disconnect the battery, what are some initializations I do have? If I do pull the headliner, might I have to calibrate something? We, again, we need to account for all that. Um, and the OEM websites, they also do have some free resources out there, but again, a lot of them are subscription based. Um, certainly, all data. Um, we at Collision Hub are in all data every single day. I've got a window open at all times throughout the day uh, through our Picatech. I use all data a ton. I guess I think from a from a PDR standpoint, having access to all data makes perfect sense. It's a it's a it's an economical way for you to have 
the access to OEM level information every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a great resource. So I definitely would look up the All Data Collision Program if you're not familiar with that. Um, we work so we work very closely with them, and I said I, I use it every day. That library request piece is pretty nice too. And the car is brand new, yep. and there's no service manual available at least through All Data. You can add the hit the library request and get what you need in 30 minutes or less. I think that's a, that's a great point because one, one, of the, one of the one thing that I hear from you know, some from vehicle makers, well, they're not always the most up-to-date because it's all it is as we release procedures. And again, if you've got a new vehicle it's not in there, you just ask. They yeah. do the research and they get in there. So I think right. that's a great, a great resource. And then you mentioned ICAR earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got collision repair training programs available. They've got some paintless dent repair articles mm -hmm. out there. Uh, but through the Repairability Technical Support website, they've got a lot of great articles, again, on whether it's on ADAS, material guide, repairability, um, corrosion protection, so things that we just need need on both. Again, a lot of overlap and yeah, overlap as well. So, awesome. Well, guys, anything uh, in closing? Yep. Absolutely. I want to make a, a very, very specific statement, um, and it's something that came up earlier today. You know, you hear all the time, well, paintless dent repair is just a superficial exterior panel damage repair, and that's it. You're wrong. It is not that okay it's not period yeah you have to be educated on how to do this correctly we may be fixing exterior panels yeah and those may be superficial panels but how do i get to it okay am i taking a door panel off am i taking a headliner out do i have to take a sunroof out that has airbags holding it in place um all mirrors do i have to take a mirror off to get to where the den is all of that stuff matters and guess what none of that is considered superficial so you need as a repair industry and as you know an insurance industry and as a collision industry you need to stop considering paintless dent repair as a superficial repair it is a safety issue period yep. non-negotiable once you start looking at it that way then you start seeing these this information come out and you're like oh man that kind of sucks okay you got to do it you know instead of trying to push back oh it's just superficial we don't care it's not. You, you make a great point, and, and here's, I just want to share this kind of from a, from a timeline standpoint. Um, in some of our conversations mm -hmm. and some of, the, some of the mobile tech things that I've been to and talking to PDR technicians, um, I've heard like, paintless net repair technicians are never going to do that. Closure repair technicians 10 years ago were saying, oh, yeah. I'm never going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been meeting with scan tool companies for a number of years through the Equipment and Tool Institute, and I heard scan tool companies say, Closure repair technicians are never going to do that. So we're, we've seen the evolution happening on, on the closure repair side of things, mm -hmm. but glass industry is certainly starting to mm -hmm. see it. As good. I think the forward casing cameras, there's a little bit, there's a little bit shorter jump, I think, there. But the same thing for paintless net repair yeah. technicians in the industry. Um, it, 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 to say that, well, we're never going to do that, um, then you're not going to be repairing vehicles, and right. you're definitely not going to be repairing them properly well, if we don't do I, it. I will say that um, you know we've been working hard to keep the education going and, and bring this stuff up for a couple years now. And a lot of our painless dent repair technicians are taking it seriously, yep. and they're doing a good job. There are, just like the collision industry, guys that are just stuck doing things the old way. Um, I'm hoping to hit more of the new guys coming into the industry and get them to understand, don't just go up with the old guys telling you. Learn this stuff and, and, and move along with the rest of the uh, industry. But yep. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. We've been you know, doing classes and promoting the proper way to repair for many years. And, we're, we are the last, you know, I'd say probably three years we've seen yeah. a real I know some growth. I know some painless dent repair technicians that have gone back to their shops and educated their shops yeah. who yeah. have looked at them and said, what? I didn't know that. And, I, and I'm, you know? I'm as guilty of that as anything. I've yeah. had several of my shops in the past that didn't do any scan stuff. And, you know, over the years of me chewing them out, yeah. telling them we need to do this, we need to do that. They have either purchased we, some. We all have to move up together. Just, uh, Jason, I tell you guys, listen. If you're a technician, focus on what you're not good at. Yeah. yeah. Focus yeah. what you're not good at. If you're good at pitching dents, what are you not good at? Mm -hmm. Go and study it as hard as you can. Reach yeah. out to resources. Yeah. yeah. And, and always be learning. Uh, again, we talked about it last week. You know, humility is a great thing. Just yeah. Yeah. always yeah. be looking. And uh, yeah. one of my favorite quotes is, "When you're green, you grow. When you're ripe, you rot." Right. Yep. And you know, if, if we we just stop there. Um, then we're going to rot. And, yep. uh, yeah. and certainly Collision Hub is going to be along for the ride. Um, we're not done working together. We're not just going to do <laughs> an hour and call it a day. Um, we've already been talking about putting some courses together um, for paintless dent repair, for the paintless dent repair industry, not on how to push or pull dents, but all the things that we, we talked about, but a lot more in depth. You know, 
pulling trim and hardware, one-time use fasteners, corrosion protection issues, scanning and diagnostics, um, all those all the things we talked about. Um, I think that we, we need to continue those conversations, continue that dialogue, and put together that curriculum for the industry. Absolutely. Uh, and um, Jake, we're going to bring you on for the ride, certainly, on that as well. So <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Um, Thank you, guys. <laughs> well, guys, I really appreciate your time. Um, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure, as always. And uh, we're going to be back tomorrow. Uh, Jake's going to be back tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m. The Aztec team will be here. Uh, we're going to be talking about Security Gateway again. Uh, we're going to get our Nissan Sentra here and talk a little bit about that, the new 2021 Sentra, and what it really means, what we need to think about uh, when it comes to the Security Gateway. Um, at 1230, uh, we'll capture the keys. We're going to be talking about capturing the keys and making sure that uh, you've got, you, you, you're setting yourself up to make sure that you're getting those customers from the keys. And at 3 o'clock, we're going to have an exclusive interview with Chuck from the Automotive Management Institute. Uh, he's going to introduce himself to the collision repair industry, talk a little bit about what AMI is working on and their plans for the future. So appreciate your time today. Um, if you haven't done so yet, go to collisioneducationfoundation.org. Click on the Donate button from the pull down, pull out the CREF uh, slash Chubb telethon. Your $50 donation gets you your technician.